Hello everyone, Demon Jester J here with five questions to a model maker. And my guest is Don Scott, uh, otherwise known as Killer Minis. How are you doing today, man? Uh, pretty good. How about yourself? I'm doing well. Thank you for being on my show. Oh, thank you for having me. Ready for the questions? Uh, yeah, sure. Go ahead. All right. Away. First question is, who are you? And please tell us about yourself and your hobby. And do you have more than one hobby? Okay, um, easy enough. Yeah, like I said, my name's Scott, and um, I'm 42 years old. I got uh, got two sons uh, who are basically young grown men now, and uh, I work at uh, a company called that you may be familiar with called 3M. They make Post-it notes and Scotch products. Pretty much everything that's uh, either in your car or your home is made by 3M. So that's cool. Um, yeah, good stuff. It's a good company, and uh, I, I do electronics there. So if anybody has uh, I've been in electronics for pretty much my whole life. So if anybody has any questions related to that, I'm always open to that. And uh, hobbies, yeah, I've got uh, I've got quite a few hobbies. Um, generally, what I do is I uh, believe it or not, because you can't if you work full time. Um, most people, anyway. Um, you can't do everything all at once. So generally what I'll do is um, something will happen in one of the hobbies and I'll obsess over that one hobby for a period of time. And I kind of go through these cycles almost like a season. Um, so basically, I mean, obviously there's war gaming, uh, computer gaming. I play guitar. You see my guitar over here inside. That's nice. And uh, I do a lot of uh, electronic tinkering and uh, my own design work. Uh, from time to time, whenever I get inspired, I guess. So definitely, I've uh, definitely got uh, plenty of hobby to keep me keep me busy for sure. And that's uh, that's pretty much it for my hobbies. All right. Number two, what got you into your hobby, and how long have you been into it? Um, well, you know, it's uh, I'm probably a little bit. The progression of how I got into hobbies is probably a lot different than most people, um, especially people my age. Um, because if you're in your 40s, um, maybe late 30s, it means you were kind of around during the heyday of uh, you know Dungeons and Dragons. Oh yeah. Uh, our, the kickoff of RPGs, basically, um, and of course, uh, War, you know, first and second edition uh, uh, Warhammer and whatnot. Um, and all of that that came about because of that, and the actual hobby that we know it is today, as far as uh, you know, painting, sculpting, you know, uh, or tabletop board gaming, and everything else that falls in line with that as well. Um, okay. A lot of people they just kind of, you know, they latched onto it at a young age, and you know, they continued, you know, throughout their life. Um, but uh, my my story is a little different. I mean, I uh, I was probably in my teens. And I had I had some close friends that were really into uh, Dungeons and Dragons, and uh, you know I enjoyed it a bit. And uh, they pulled me in for uh, basically I was a sit-in for someone who used to go AWOL every once in a while during their campaigns. Right. And um, so I was a villain for that, and that's really where I got my exposure. Um, and uh, but other than that, I mean, um, I really started kind of going off, going to the hobby stores and looking around what was there. I played uh, Traveler for years, um, really by myself uh, and uh, like my younger brother. And uh, it was it was an age old problem back then, pre internet. Um, these types of hobbies, there was nobody around. Um, you didn't have YouTube, you know. You didn't have. You might have had one local game store, but nobody was coordinated. You know what I mean? And yeah. It just it it wasn't heard of. Um, it, it was rare enough just to be part of Dungeons and Dragons, but 
to be part of tabletop working, at least in the United States, it was, it was very, very small. Yep. So every time I would get into it, you know, I would shortly fizzle out because there was just nobody there to to really enjoy the hobby with. So I understand. Yeah. So anyway, it's uh, I was around, and then of course, you know, at that age, it was my teens. So I, I got, uh, I think I bought my, uh, I think it was a first edition uh, Warhammer 40k because I was completely confused. Uh, I read it multiple times, and I'm like, I just don't understand what this game is. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen before. And they would explain it, but it was like, I, I just don't get it. You don't ever see anybody doing it. You know, where do you do this at? Like, they talk about this, and they talk about that. And at the same time, I think in, in those older editions, they also were promoting their other, you know, uh, their other games, um, other ways of playing. And I don't know if Space Hulk was out at that time or not, but um, I think they had books, and they, just, they had different things out at that time. And if you looked at White Dwarf, it was like, I just don't get it, you know what I mean? So uh, I thought it was really interesting, and uh, I bought a few models and um, didn't even attempt to paint them. And uh, again, you know, just nobody really to to congregate with and, and explore the hobby. So it was at that age that I found women, you know, and my hormones started kicking in. And I kind of pretty much, you know, set all that stuff aside. And then through the years, it was always something that I, I wanted to do. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I picked it up here and there and then quit because, again, they're just, it's a small, it's a niche uh, hobby. It's, like, it's very different than if you, say, play guitar. Um, I could go to a grocery store and introduce myself to 50 people, and I could probably find at least 20 people that had tried to play guitar. And I'd probably find five people that actually play the guitar, you know, just in, in, in one hour. But you do the same thing and say, hey, you ever, you ever heard of tabletop board game? You know, um, it would be a much different a different story. But nowadays, of course, you know, with, with YouTube and um, the internets and interwebs, you can find a lot more. So anyway, um, I basically, somewhere in my mid-30s, I kind of hit a uh, your traditional uh, midlife type crisis where you start to go, hey, there are all these things I wanted to do in my life, you know. I'm tired of thinking about doing them, and now I want to do them. So I started with the guitar, and I said, hey, I always want to learn how to play guitar. So I taught myself how to play guitar pretty much through uh, YouTube and through the Internet and through books. That's cool. And I just plugged away every day, day after day after day. And it's the same thing. I got obsessed with it. You know, I, I stuck on it for a couple of years, and then I said, hey, you know, this – Wargaming thing. I've always wanted to, you know, really get into that and to, to paint up my miniatures and to, you know, get my army ready and to take it to a to a game store and play other people. And I, little did I know, really, what what was involved in the hobby. So it was only a couple of years ago that I, I jumped into it, and uh, was about thirty nine, and um, and yeah, so I jumped into it full steam, and I've been hooked ever since. Um, I pretty much spend all my disposable income on some way, shape, or form of the hobby. If it's not uh, a new game that's coming out on Kickstarter or a potential game or a role-playing game or something to support my YouTube channel or, or supplies, paints, I can't even go to the store without going, hey, ooh, look at that. Um, wow, that's pretty cool. That's $10 at the dollar store, and I could make terrain out of that. You know, it's, <laughs> Yeah, it, it could be, you know how it goes. It could be anything. It could, it could be a spatula, and you're like, ooh, well, I could use that as a jello. Uh, I found some jello molds, you know, and I'm like, oh, that would be a good uh, little container to actually cast my own figures in one day. Oh, let me buy that. You know? <laughs> yep. So you end up with, with, I hate to pan my camera the rest of my room because it's just a pile of crap. So <laughs> um, you easily can, can, can get a lot of garbage pretty quick. So, um, so yeah, it's one second. Perfect. So other than that, I mean, that's pretty much where I'm at. I, technically, I've been in the hobby for probably about two years now, and um, cool. And I'm really kind of all over the place um, because there's so much in the hobby. It's uh, you know, I'm I'm kind of I'm experimenting in all different areas. You know, I'm, I'm looking for. Um, you know, I'm looking for that holy grail of a rule set that I want to really invest heavily in. And of course, 
with different rule sets, you've got, you know, you have to have different levels of expectation. You know, do I want to play a, uh, a war band skirmish game, tabletop, or do I want to play something that's more in depth, that's somewhat skirmish at a very small party level, that's more like an RPG, or do I want to play epic battles where everything's based on stands, or do I want to find something you know halfway in between? So lately, I've been really delving heavy into uh, into a lot of different board gaming rules um, to try to find you know. You have this like gauge, you know, where you play a game and it's like beer and pretzels. Like a uh, good example is uh, is uh, uh, Super Dungeon Explorer by Soda Pop Minis. I oh yeah, that's that a game great, a great and it, minis a and great game. game. Great minis. It, it's you know I can't complain about it. But in the end of the day, after you play the game, you know, um, for me anyway, it's like I, I want there to be more depth. So you, you start looking for that next tier up, you know, and then you're like, oh well, you know. Maybe that's, you know, you go too far and you go, that's too much depth. You know, if you go to something like uh, historical board gaming, for example, where, you know, you're you're spending an hour trying to figure out how to wheel, you know, one small company of spearmen or, you know, or phalanx, uh, Greek phalanx or whatnot. So anyway, it's, uh, I'm kind of all over the place. I, I'm, I'm, into the, I'm into kind of, I guess you could call it game design in a way. So I'm trying to find that. You know that that one rule set um, or three rule sets for each level right that i discussed like epic mid mid tabletop uh size and then maybe skirmish okay. um, and then i'm also doing youtube videos and you got the painting side of things um you've got you know sculpting and it just it never ends you got terrain making and, and the more you learn about the hobby the more you find out that there's all these little fingers that go in different directions yeah. And, and in a way, they're kind of distractions, but uh, um, it, it's definitely it's, it's been a it's definitely been a been a good couple of years here. So I'm, I don't anticipate it going away. It's right. uh, it's kind of hooks into me for life. So yeah, that's for sure. All right, number three. When and why did you start making YouTube videos, and have you met anyone from YouTube because of it? All right. Um, yeah, I, like I said, I, uh, I started my channel um, about two years ago. Um, and I think in, initially I started it because I just really wanted it to be kind of like a like a video log, you know, like a vlog of what I was doing because I was new to the hobby. Um, and I slowly started learning that, you know, to really do it that way was going to be quite difficult because there's all these things you have to learn along the way, you know, like, well, got an intro and then you got video editing and then in the beginning you've got you know you've got a size um a size cap from youtube of like for 15 minutes so you know how do you fit it all in that 15 minutes and and how do i make it interesting and then you start you know uh looking at all the data and going well you know i need to get more subscribers and you know it, if you start looking at it like that kind of like you would track a you know a stock in the stock market then you've got that whole aspect, and that kind of tickles my my financial brain, so um, my statistical brain, where it's like, okay, you know, if I can get, you know, this many subscribers this year, and then this year, and then that year, then maybe, <laughs> just maybe, I might actually be able to, you know, have enough residual income from the AdSense to to pay for, you know, at least half of the hobby that I'm paying for, you know, mm -hmm. so that I could have more content, you know what I mean? So yeah, it's. Uh, it's definitely been a couple of years, and uh, like I said, I, I really realized that uh, instead of doing a vlog, that that um, I slowly, through about a year's learning curve, realized that uh, it's a, it's just another way for me to express myself creative, uh, creatively, um, from like a tutoring and a teaching perspective. So right now. Um, you know, I've, I've got a bunch of uh, raw footage for painting tutorials that I'm kind of holding back on. Um, but I'm more, I'm, for, I'm focused right now more on the gaming aspect. And I'm having a lot of fun with a lot of Kickstarter board games that I bought, um, like Zombie Side. I got Sedition Wars now. Um, I got Dreadfall. Uh, and I got, you know, I got more coming. And uh, I'm finding that I'm really enjoying, you know, breaking down the rules and saying, hey, here's a tactics tip. You know, because that's one thing I'm seeing that people really aren't doing on YouTube 
some people do it, um, but in many cases, they're not actually playing the game over and over and over. And it's, I think that shows. I, I think that if you really own that game and you watch a video and you go, uh, it's just some, some basic review. You know, this guy's really not covering, you know, how do I get better at the game? You know, let me know the meat and potatoes. Uh, let me get the insight. You know, how does this guy play? Or how do I play aggressively? How do I play conservatively? That type of thing. So I'm, I'm kind of finding, I'm really enjoying that. So I'm kind of letting it go um, in the direction that it's going to go for now. And uh, I express myself from a, from a teaching and tutoring type perspective. Because, um, I mean, after all, I mean, YouTube is a great avenue for that because um, where else can you kind of teach somebody something and um, they're not going to interrupt you. You've got 100%, you know, attention. At least you think you do. Of course, if people watch your videos, they skip all through them and they watch the first 10 seconds and then you shut it off. And, you know, but um, I actually pay attention to my my attention, my, uh, my attention, what do they call it? Your, uh, your retention. Attention span. Yeah, so you kind of see, you know, how much, where you start losing people in your video. And uh, I, I try to improve, you know, hopefully maintain or captivate a portion of my audience throughout the video. But, yep. So it's, uh, it's definitely good stuff. Um, I've met, I've met just some outstanding people. I'm uh, not sure how it happened, but uh, I, I kind of was in the right place at the right time. And uh, when I started doing YouTube videos, I, I, I found Ventrilo, uh, a good, you know, a lot of people use it for gaming, but it's also it can easily be considered a social media, um, you know, tool. And um, I very quickly started meeting uh, other YouTube video producers and either commission painters or war gamers or just, you know, people that enjoy the hobby. Um, and I've, I've really, I've made some really great friends. Um, and it, and it can, actually, in many respects, it's kind of been, it's kind of been somewhat of a distraction to my actual hobby because I've met such great friends. <laughs> I spend more time, you know, on a daily basis kind of hanging out with my buddies uh, uh, than actually, you know, really doing the hobby like I initially intended. Um, you know, which isn't isn't a cut on my butt at all. It's just it's just how life is. It's really a compliment that uh, that I enjoy their company. Um, you know, I've met uh, people that, that you may be aware. You know, I'm uh, pretty good friends with uh, Les over at Austin Paint Job. That's uh, cool. Chung from uh, Board Gamers Consortium. Um, Van over at Van Hammer Minis, um, and then a bunch of other guys too that are up and coming. Uh, you know, YouTube uh, video guys and. And some people that just are video are war gamers, and a lot of these friendships that I've cultivated over the last year, you know, I I, I honestly anticipate that uh, we'll probably be friends for life. You know, it's we're it, it's always an internet type thing, right? You know, but uh, at the end of the day, you know, after you know a couple of years go by and you're talking to people every day, you know, you can definitely uh, you know formulate some some close and long lasting. Uh, one lasting relationship. So I've been extremely, uh, I guess you could say blessed in that perspective. And uh, I definitely hope that continues. And I think that's an aspect that people don't really consider when they, when they get into the hobby. Um, if you look at YouTube, it's not, you know, unfortunately in, in some respect, because there's a, you know, there's a business element to YouTube. Um, and I agree with that. And, and in some respect, you know, there's, there is that business element. Um, and, and it can turn some people off, but I, I think people need to remember that that in the end, uh, you got to think about the the uh, the heart of what YouTube is. You know, and that is you know sharing information, creativity, meeting people, you know, connecting with like-minded individuals to say, hey, you know, even if it's only through comments, hey, I really enjoyed your video, and you know, um, you know, I'm looking forward to this or looking forward to that, and it's it, it's it's you know the interaction with other people. You don't have that power. Like I said earlier, if you go down to the store and you go, hey, if I stand up in the middle of my grocery store, hey, everybody, who plays war games? You know, I, I'm not sure anybody would even get that. Or I'd probably have to specify tabletop war games, not video war games. You know, it, yeah. it, would, be, it would be very rare. But uh, through something like Google Plus and Skype and YouTube and all these different social media, um, applications you know you really can connect individuals and uh it, it's a great thing and I, I would highly suggest that anybody new to the hobby 
or even people that have been in it for a while that are kind of lurking in different areas to really kind of come out of your shell and to utilize the community for what it's there for. And, cool. You know, formulate, I agree to that. Formulate some good relationships there. So, yeah. All right. Number four. Do you have any tips on anyone new getting into your hobby or making YouTube? And this is including making YouTube videos. Yeah. So if you have anybody new getting into your hobby or making YouTube videos, you could okay. either do one or you could do both. It's your choice. No, it's kind of, yeah, it's like a two-part question. So yeah. um, I guess I'll address the new getting into, you know, the hobby, you know. Um, I'd say as far as a tip, I one of the first important things is for people to realize that, like I said earlier, that the hobby has, you know, it has many different um you know, different tributaries, many different fingers on the main branch, which is the hobby, you know, and that is, you know, uh, you know painting, sculpting, uh, you've got you know, actually playing the game itself, uh, uh, the social aspect, going out to your, your local game store, going to tournaments, um, internet social activity, uh, train making, you know, it goes on and on. And to understand that you kind of have to compartmentalize these different parts of the hobby and figure out, you know, what you want to get out of it. You kind of have to say to yourself, okay, well, you know, it's, it's so vast that um, you easily, and I did this myself, I, I really just kind of was like a dog chasing my tail. You know, I was like, oh, cool, let me get some stuff from my bench. And, oh, I want to do YouTube videos. And, oh, I want to paint. And, well, hold on, look, look, I want a war game now. Um, let me go down to my local game store. And instead of really doing one thing fairly well, um, what I kind of did the first year is kind of run around and did everything not very well. <laughs> because there was so much to do, you can get kind of overwhelmed with all this vast information that's at your fingertips. So I think in the beginning, as far as the tip is to be able to understand and compartmentalize these things and to figure out, you know, which ones you want to focus on in the early part of your hobby experience. You know, right. if that's, if you say, hey, you know, I, I really, I, I love the way these models look on Cool Mini or Not, and, and uh, you know, Ravage Magazine, uh, White Dwarf, and, you know, I just, I really want to be able to paint like that. Then, my, you know, my tip is to focus on that element of the hobby and, and try not to get sidetracked. And then, you know, spend all your time, you know, getting information, uh, researching, and, and trying to hone your skill you know, based on that part of the hobby. If, if you really want to get into it because you, you love the aspect of playing the game, then, you know, maybe not focus so much on, you know, high-end painting and maybe more on, you know, just uh, tabletop quality just so you can feel, the, feel an army. And maybe not even that at all because of the initial investment. Maybe, you know, jump into army painter and just, you know, spray a quick, you know, color or two on it so you can get gaming right away. So you can... <coughs> Sorry about that. That's okay. So you can immerse yourself in the rules and interact with other people and figure out what game you really want to play. Yep. Because, you know, there's quite a few out there. Um, so that's probably uh, one of the tips from that area. Also, when it comes to the uh, actual hobby itself, um, I would say... You also don't go crazy with your supplies, and you, I would recommend that you you, you pick a game if, if you if you want to get into the wargaming aspect of it. Um, pick a game that, unfortunately, that's popular. You know, it may not be the best game to really invest in. Um, however, if your goal is gaming and you want to play, then you're going to have to kind of pick something that everybody's playing. You know, and like. Right now, I mean, that's pretty much, you know, Warhammer 40K, um, you know, War Hordes or War Machine. War Machine um, or Hordes, yeah. Yeah, um, maybe Malifo, you know, that's oh, kind of yeah. coming on. And that's really it. I mean, there's, I don't know if I'm leaving anything out. There's a lot of other games There's so many there. little games out there, but like the zombie games, games, like the card games are, like the, mm -hmm. there's so many out there. You get lost in the fray when you go to a game shop. It's like, yeah. what do I want to play? Everything's so cool. <laughs> Not only that, but that's the kind of stuff that's going to, if you don't pick the right thing from the beginning, um, it's going to be the kind of thing that burns you out real quick. 
and it's going to confuse you because you're not going to have the support. You're not going to have people to play. So even though I personally don't really recommend, you know, jumping into 40 K, um, unfortunately it's the biggest game in town, uh, in most U S cities. Um, and if your goal really is to play the game and that's all, then that's kind of what you have to start with. And then, I agree, you know, as you get through, you know, maybe your first army and be it space springs or Tau or whatever you play, then you can start trying to experiment with some of the boutique games, some of the smaller games that other people won't play. And kind of do what I'm doing, you know, find your holy grail of a game. Um, and you'll you'll know when you hit it because you're like, you'll love it. You, you won't, you'll, you'll dream about it. <laughs> you'll wake up and go, oh man, I can't wait to play that tomorrow. You know, it's, yep. it, it, it will be that ingrained in you. You'll get obsessed with it. So, um, and then, so as far as the second part of the question uh, was, uh, was, that was, was uh, YouTube videos. As far yes. as making YouTube videos, um, I can sum that up pretty briefly, and that is, it's kind of the same thing. You, I think when you start off, you have to know, you have to be fair to yourself and do an assessment and, and understand why do I really want to do it. You know, you see a lot of people that jump on and go, oh, I just want to get subscribers. I want to get a whole bunch of subscribers. And that's their whole focus. Um, but you really should be asking yourself, well, why? You know, what are you, what's your goal for your channel? So you, you'd have to be honest with yourself in the beginning and say, well, why do I really want to make videos? You know, is it because I want to share the experience I'm, I'm doing? Maybe I, maybe there's something I feel that I could bring to the hobby that, that other people aren't currently bringing. Exactly. Um, you know, and do your research, look around in that, in that market, so to speak, you know, and, and figure out, you know, what people are doing, like, who, who are the lead guys, you know, if you want to do paint tutorials, you know, watch awesome paint job and, and see, you know, how did he get so popular? What is it that he did? You know, and, um, can I do it better? Um, you know, or maybe there's an element that I could do differently or, uh, or whatever. If, if you want to get into sculpting, it's the same thing, you know, look at who's, the head honcho and try to figure out, you know, how to better it or, or figure out, you know, what angle you want to approach and kind of stick with it. You know, um, I say that it's great advice. Um, I didn't do it myself. <laughs> I spent the first year kind of floating around with, with different, uh, different ideas for my channel. And if you work full time, um, you know, and, uh, you just don't have a lot of free time, it, it's going to be hard, but my number one tip is, to kind of know what you want out of your channel. And secondly, I would say, um, kind of like real estate. In real estate, they say location, location, location. And I believe that with YouTube, that it's it's content, content, content. Um, and I didn't come up with that idea. Actually, I think Les told me that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really the key. No matter what, you can sit there and debate, you know, popular channels, why this person is, isn't popular, why... This person took four years to get a thousand subs. Why it took this one only four months? Um, there's a lot of gimmicks out there. You know, you could have contests, and which I don't recommend. But, um, you can, you know, to try to get people to your channel. There's a lot of little things you can do. But in the end, you know, you, you want good subscribers. You want people that are there for a reason because they like your stuff. Yep. So you can solve all those problems by just content, 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 putting it out as regularly as you can, and making yep. it the best quality that you can do. A lot of people get hung up with, hey, it has to be as good as so-and-so. Believe it or not, I mean, that's really not the spirit of YouTube. There's people that do that. You know, I use Les as an example. He does, um, he's just as good a painter as he is a video producer. His stuff is phenomenal. Um, it really is. It's, it's just, it's top quality. And he prides himself on it. Oh, yeah. Um, I would. But it's, it's not really... It's one way to do it. Um, but if you really look all across YouTube, um, you really only need to meet kind of a minimum standard when it comes to video production. And a lot of it is going to come from people being interested in what you do. Um, so there again, it's the content, you know, the quality of content and as much as you can put out that's, that's good quality. And in focused, like I spoke of earlier, you knowing what you want in your channel. Or Still be, filming episode after episode of, of what you want it to be if it's a series or you know whatever whatever have you so and try not to get frustrated 
that's another good tip is, yep. um, you know, everybody thinks that it's going to be easy and, you know, you're going to have thousands of subscribers and it just doesn't work that way. Oh, yeah. Hard work, work makes, work. This, see, I found out doing YouTube videos, hard work, the harder you work on a video, it doesn't matter how much work you put into a video, it's not going to be the same amount of subscribers because you think, oh, I may get more subscribers because I put a lot of work in this video. I film the show on my webcam. I do a screen catch. Yeah, I put a little bit of background, stuff like that, and I put some 3D in front of it. But mm -hmm. my show is getting the knowledge of each person I interview and yeah. get the reason why. And I have people have asked me in other hangouts, like, why do you interview these people? Why? And I've told them because I want to know more about the person. That's the only reason why I do it is because I want to know more about you. I want to know more about the person that's making the videos that are behind the, per the person making behind the videos. Because a person, you end up become everybody's like, oh, why don't you just watch the videos and get to know them that way? Because you're not really getting to know the person. You're just getting to know their video style. Yeah, and you can't watch every single video that comes out of every subscriber or you know, person you're subscribed to. It's too much time. Exactly. You know, who's got time for that? I mean, it, I'd love to be able to do it. In theory, it'd be great. But um, it, technically, what you're really doing is just picking people's brains and you're putting that information out there um, for people to have access to. Exactly. So instead, of, instead of you just, you know, getting the knowledge of, you know, whatever I'm imparting to you, you know, it, it's out there for everybody to see. You know? Yeah. And if it only helps two or three people, that's out what of the hundred people or however many that watch it, to me personally, it's worth it. Because exactly. we all knew at one point and we were like, oh my God, I just don't get it. You know, what's this? How come so and so says that this is layering and so and so says this is wet blending and this person says it's glazing and you're like, what the hell? You know, and it's the same technique. Is, <laughs> yeah, it's, just, it's basically the same technique. It's, it's applied differently, you know, and, and to some people it means different things. So it's kind of an ambiguous term. Yep. It's, sometimes it's used very loosely. Um, and depending on who's using it, 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 like I said, it means something different. So, um, and that's extremely confusing for somebody who's new. And they just want, you know, hey, I want to do this technique, you know, and it's not like, okay, base code. So, yeah. but it's good stuff. And I, I think it's important. I look at your channel and um, I think having, you know, episode after episode, somebody looks at your videos, um, it makes a lot more sense. People know what they're getting when they jump on your channel. Yeah. If you jump on a channel and, you know, there's one video that's this, and then there's three other weird videos they may not be interested in, and then there's another what they came there for. And it, it really gets muddled pretty quick. Um, you know, if you actually look at my channel, mine, I kind of did that like my first year. And then you can kind of see as I, you know, as I started to get through that learning curve, that there was a bit more thought when the videos came out. Oh, yeah. They kind of led into each other. So, definitely, uh, definitely agree with you there. Yeah. All right. Ready for number five? Sure deal. Do you like an airbrush or paintbrush, or do you use both, and why? different schools of thought with that question. Um, unfortunately, it seems like in our hobby, for whatever reason, I'm not really quite sure why, but it seems like people kind of end up dividing into two camps. Yeah, I know, that's why I made the question up. <laughs> it's, it's almost like politics. It's like, oh, okay, well, you're going to be a painter. Oh, okay, well, you got to choose. Are you going to be, are you going to be Republican or Democrat? Are you going to use a airbrush or are you going to use good old fashioned paintbrush? And unfortunately, um, even though that's kind of how it seems sometimes, I, I really don't think that that really should be that way. That's my personal opinion. Yeah, same here. Um, I think that, I think people forget. I think we get kind of uh, closed minded when we think about our hobby. Um, and, in effect, what we, what we're all doing when we're painting models is we're becoming artists and it, if you watch an artist work, say they're an illustrator, you know, yeah, there may be one particular set of tools that they use um, or a medium that they use more often than not, but I guarantee you that they've tried them all. So if they're an illustrator, they might use, um, you know, uh, uh, markers and Sharpies. 
Um, they could use different shades of uh, pencils, you know, an A, what's it, HB2, HB1. You do nothing but pencil drawings. You can do ink, black ink. You can do colored inks. Um, you can do oil paints. You can do acrylic paints. You know, it just keeps going on and on. And it could be the same image, but just with different tools and different mediums and different vehicles to get your artistic expression, you know, shown. And I really think it's the same thing when it comes to um, either an airbrush um, and or a paintbrush. It, it's kind of up to you to kind of experiment with both and to kind of figure out, you know, which one you're going to use. Some people naturally are going to gravitate toward a particular one um, for different reasons. Um, you know, maybe they don't like using the airbrush. Maybe they don't like the, um, the initial investment when it comes to an airbrush, because now you got to buy the airbrush, you got to buy a tank. Um, now you got to start, you know, uh, considering, you know, what types of paints to use. Can I use the same paints? How do I thin the paints? How do I get the right consistency? And it's, you have to learn an entire new skill all over again. Well, I got news for you. It's the same thing if you switch from drawing with pencils to painting your image with an oil paint, you're going to have to learn that particular medium all over again. So it's the same thing. I mean, there really is no necessarily a right or a wrong way to do it. And in the end, you're going to end up with maybe uh, a different result. If you use a lot of paint brushing technique, you're going to end up with, you know, a very clean model. Um, you're probably going to have, um, you're probably going to use or, or utilize it on models that are probably larger and have a little more open space than, you know, 28 mil figures, um, uh, just because of the detail that's required. Um, your pride. It's going to end up, in the end, my personal opinion with, with, with an airbrush um, is that the finished result is sometimes it's almost, for me, it's too clean. <laughs> they, they look great, but unfortunately, they kind of look a little lifeless and they almost look mass produced, uh. which, which is why some people like commissioned painters love them because their job is to do, you know, to make it look the best that they can, to make their client happy in the quickest amount of time they can so they can make as much money and recoup their loss, basically, because it takes so long to paint. If you got to paint, you know, I don't know, a 500-point Warhammer Army, um, are you going to really want to sit there with a paintbrush or are you going to grab an airbrush, at least, you know, to block in some of the larger colors, you know, um, like by painting, you know. Um, yeah, if I was a commission painter, I'd probably... I'd probably heavily uh, utilize the airbrush. Um, you know, I'm actually not a commission painter, so I tend personally to uh, to to lean more toward the paintbrush um, because it allows okay. me to to get the look that I want. It's it's a bit more organic when you're finished. It's a bit, bit more personalized, maybe rough. Um, for, yeah, a little more so rough. Yeah, 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 it's a little bit more rougher and. Um, and I can develop my own skill. I mean, you can do the same thing with an airbrush. I mean, you, like I said, there's really no right way or wrong way. I think Les has said it before that uh, um, it's just a different tool that, for you to use however you want to use it. Yep. You, know, you, you can't say that you can't use an airbrush to do fine detail because you can. No. A, well, yeah, you can do it. You just have to. You have to learn how to do it. You have to apply that uh, particular technique. I haven't yeah. learned. <laughs> Yeah, I admit yeah, that. Yeah. I go brush instantly on its fine details. No. I mean, you can. You, you have to get a really fine needle. And, you know, there's some tricks. You can do some masking and use some stencils. and You can do just as much as you can with a regular brush with an airbrush. Yeah, um, true. You know, um, and obviously once you, once you acquire that skill, um, you might find it's easier than a paintbrush. But, you know, it, like I said, it's, it's either way. It's it's uh, which tool do you want to use for the job? Me personally, um, as a painter, I plan on utilizing everything that's at my disposal. Um, you know, that includes, you know, working with pigments, using oil paints, using acrylic paints, using inks, using dyes, using different mediums. Um, you know, if I get away with it, you know, I'll use colored pencils on a figure. If it, <laughs> if it serves a purpose, you know, you can use it for... I well, seen I seen people shoes. take uh, eight number two pencils and rub them on the barrels of guns and put a clear mm -hmm. coat on it just to make it have that metallic sheen on it. From right. using, I mean, it's, 
It's an old school trick that they use from a uh, that's from from uh, tank making, but I've seen people do on guns for Warhammer and they they get the same effect. And I was like, wow, I forgot all about that trick when uh, I was making tanks. Yeah, I think so, it's like a scale, uh, maybe a scale modeler type uh, type trick. Yeah, when it's a scale modeling scale trick, thing. and I never thought about using it on Warhammer the, mm -hmm. for a, a bolt pistol or even uh, a a a flamer and never thought about doing that and I'm like wait a minute that would work it's yeah. those little tricks that no one thinks of I mean it's the same thing with different you know people use different paints and it's just the thing is is if you if you look at it from a perspective and look at I'm not just really painting an army to throw on the tabletop I'm focusing on becoming you know a painter uh, an artist then it really becomes well I'm the painter, and if it's my specific piece, you know, I want to use whatever I can to get a particular desired result. When I'm done, I want to be happy with it. I want it to look realistic, and I want it to look cool, and I want it to, you know, I want it to be what I want, right? Yep. And if that means that you, you know, um, uh, I forget who did this. I think it might even been General Splatton. Um, he was using hairs from his head to use as um, uh, saliva snot, like in between like an orc's jaws. I never even um, saw that. So yeah, you, talk you, take, you take a gray hair, because it would take paint well, and he would glue it. And then he somehow he painted it and put some, you know, some gloss varnish on it. And, and technically, you could use anything. You could use you know, any kind of a wow. spray hair. But that's, the point is, is that, you know, as an artist, he said, hey, let me try this, you know, and you only find out through through experimenting. Oh yeah. Um, and that's that's really what artists do. I mean, they don't. If you look at the you know artists from the old days, they don't go, well, I can't do that because they don't sell that at my art store. No, I mean they were making their own paints. The, the old oil painters, they all had their own homebrew of. Um, yeah, they took uh, pigments uh, and different pigments and varnishes and uh, mix their own. Yeah, you know, different spirits and all the stuff that they use. I, Oil paints is a whole other, a whole other echelon. If you ever try to get into that, oh, yeah. but, um, but anyway, so I really don't think there's any right or wrong way. Um, I think if if you truly want to be an artist, that you have to embrace everything that's out there. Um, it's going to help you get the desired result. It may not even be something for you at that moment in time, but as you evolve as an artist and you start looking for another way to do something, to say, hey, you know. Let me give that a try. You know, like there's a lot of people now that are using pigments um, that weren't before. Oh, yeah. Um, because of a, well, it's, a lot of people are like, oh, I didn't know I could do that. And then the poof, it just blew up that pigments could be used to make mud, used to do this, used to do that. I didn't know you could use cornstarch to make uh, make snow. Now you can, people are using cornstarch to make snow. I didn't know you can yeah. use cornstarch to fill in gaps on a model using crazy glue. I didn't know, oh, well, it's baking soda. Uh, to fill in gaps. I, I didn't know I could do that. Holy smoke. Wow. And all these little tips and tricks that it's, um, it's because of the power of YouTube that someone else has showed it. Oh, yeah. So that's, I guess that's pretty much my spiel on the airbrush versus the paintbrush. All right. Was, Ready for well, number six? Was, uh, pretty much clear. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. What was your favorite mini or model to paint, build, and why? I would have to say it was, uh, was he at? I would say that he was probably my pirate. I decided early in, in my painting to, uh, I think he's like a 54 millimeter figure. Okay. Which is, uh, I guess it's like what, 170 second scale? Yeah, 170 second, I think that's, uh, I think that's the scale. Uh, he's definitely, if I put him up against a uh, space marine. He should be a little bit taller. Yeah, you can kind of see he's he's almost double. Yeah, his, wa his waist is about as the Space Marine's head. Wow. Um, so he's kind of a bigger model, and this was my favorite model, not really because of what uh, what the finished result was, um, just because uh, every part that's part of this pirate, you know, whether it's his hair or his shirt or his uh, his pants, his, his skin. Uh, the sword, um, every surface that's on this model, I basically was experimenting with 
all the painting techniques that I was trying to get a handle on. That's cool. Um, and in many cases, like uh, on the back of the shirt, I did like the French style glazing. <laughs> cool. Um, where I, I probably spent 40 hours at least just painting the back of that miniature. And actually, if you want to look at it, this is a bad picture, but you can uh, if you go to my YouTube channel. You, there's a couple of videos on this guy. Um, but on the front of him, I painted him um, using uh, wet blend and a uh -huh. little bit of uh, uh, washing technique. And then on the pants, I did more of a dry brush in back, but on the front, I did uh, glazing, you know. And so for me, that was my favorite one because of the result that I got. Not really. I was somewhat happy with it. But I literally spent probably two or three months on this guy. <laughs> um, and I started over in many in many spots. I was like, oh, I don't like that. And I, I changed the color and I went back and I dumped it in the tank. And um, and finally, uh, because of my, my friends, they said, hey, you know, you're never going to be happy with it. So you're just going to have to learn to stop. <laughs> yeah, you're going to have to just, you know, take from it what you've learned and, and, and call it quits once you're somewhat happy with it and uh, and get better on the next model. So this particular figure has got a lot of history for me. For one, it's the first miniature that I complain, uh, that I painted completely from beginning to end. Um, and also it was the first one that I started to learn all my techniques. Um, and even now I can look at it and kind of laugh. It's like, oh, I could do that much better now. Oh yeah. <laughs> but at the time, I mean, I poured my heart and soul into this figure. You know, if, if this thing were to disappear, somebody came and took it or they got broke or whatever. You'd you know, cry. I, I'd be a little disappointed, you know, because it's, it's, it's for me, it's, it's, uh, it's a part of history. So that's, uh, uh, that's pretty much my, my favorite figure. So, so far to date anyway. That's and, cool. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Now this question is, uh, a little choppy. What's your opinion of a model maker to a war gamer? I already explained this to you before we started recording. Right. Well, not, let me clarify, though. A model maker, you mean like uh, somebody who is doing a lot of painting or, or, or someone that like, or like say, say someone likes making tanks and trucks and stuff like that, cars, but they start game, war game, they start making model figurines. Mm -hmm. Can they take, I know they can take those, those traits, but would they, some people that automatically go from, making model trucks and model tanks and all that and go into war gaming, they take all the same techniques they did from the war the modeling aspect, mm -hmm. put into a game, put into their figurines and think, but they put the way too much. Mm -hmm. So is there like a a happy medium or do you think there's two separate like factions? Like there's definitely war gamers and there's model makers. Yeah, I mean um or is there a happy in between? Well it's like anything else, you know, it's, it's kind of like the, the, the airbrush and the paintbrush question. I mean, it's, it's very similar. It, it comes down to what you're, you know, what that particular individual is trying to get out of, you know, what portion of the hobby that they're aspiring to. You know, I, I think when you say model maker, you, maybe you mean like scale modeler. Yeah, like scale model, scale model truck, stuff like that. Right. So, and, and there's definitely a separation between scale modeling and... Uh, and working and wargaming, uh, hobbying, as far as painting and whatnot. Um, and that's really because of the scale. So there's a lot of different techniques that you can utilize. Matter of fact, that most people that were utilizing an airbrush were, were scale modelers mm -hmm. because it, it made a lot more sense to be able to cover uh, large flat areas um, on tanks and whatnot, um, as opposed to trying to paint, you know, a, a tiny little scale in miniature. So, um, I think, I think it's like anything else that, um, unfortunately, there's like this separation between the uh, the two, the two categories. But there really doesn't need to be. There's a lot of information. Um, boy, my eyes really bother me here. There's a lot of information that you can that you can carry over from one hobby into into wargaming. You know, like the airbrush is a good example. You can't maybe apply the same exact techniques. Um, you're going to have to tailor it to fit that scale of, 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 of painting, right? Mm -hmm. um, but in the end, uh, fundamentally, 
I believe that most things you're going to do are going to be very, very similar. Mm -hmm. So you're going to you're going to have an advantage. Um, it would be, you know, just like if somebody was a um, an oil painter on canvas, and they switched over to painting, you know, and a lot of people have done that. If you look, um, and you see a lot of the a lot of the French and Spanish painters now that are just painting things phenomenal. Um, a lot of these people are, are professionally trained um, artists that mm -hmm. have gone to you know school, and and they painted on canvas, and uh, it may not be you know a three dimensional object, but they're utilizing all the same techniques. They're utilizing you know uh, color transitions and shading, highlighting, and lighting, uh, uh, blending, dry brushing. Um, you know um, all these different techniques that we we know of. They're not, they're not innate to the working hobby. They came from somewhere else. You know, they came from other artists um, in the '80s when nobody was wargaming, and they said, "Hey, you know, uh, paint up the Space Marine." You know, and how else do you think that they, if, if if you put yourself in that position, someone just threw a Space Marine at you for the first time, and there really was no internet. There really was, um, you know, no. No, no experts at that time to show you how to do it. You're you're going to start doing your research and go, well, I'm going to apply paint to it. So what do, you know, what do I need to do? What are the techniques I need to learn how to do? And then you're going to try to apply those techniques and figure out that, okay, well, it's a little different because you know a, a model doesn't really absorb paint the way a flat canvas paper does, mm -hmm. or uh, you know whatever they use the the uh, the gesso, you know. It's going to react a little differently. Plus, it's 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 two dimensional. It's not three dimensional. It's perfectly flat. So um, it's going to behave a little differently. So as you paint the model, you're going to go, hey, you know, there, there's different things that I need to change here. Maybe my paint needs to be thinner. Yep. I can't use this really thick acrylic paint because it looks horrible. I got all these brush marks, and they and they stick out. You know, when I look at it from 12 inches away, you know, it looks it looks horrendous. Um, whereas painting. Your perspective may be, you know, I don't know, nine or twelve feet away, depending on the size of the painting, right? Yep. You're not supposed to be looking at Van Gogh from two inches away. You know, everything's going to be pixelated. And you're going to say, "Hey, it looks like crap." Well, I got news for you: if you stick your face up to a TV, it's going to look like crap too. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to see a bunch of little dots, and you're going to go, "Hey, you know, I thought this was high definition." Well, yeah, sure, at a particular viewing distance um, with the human eye. At, so many frames per second, you know, it goes on and on. Um, so I really think it's another one of those uh, areas where people tend to divide into two camps. And in the end, everybody is still at some level an artisan, you know. And I, I think there's things you can take over and things that you can you can do. And I think you actually be uh, a more balanced artist if, if you're doing that. I really don't think it. People should stick their nose up and go, "Hey, well, you're, you're a scale model, or you're, you're talking about." You know, it's not necessarily true. I think people need to be a bit more open-minded, um, especially in our hobby. I mean, there's not that many people that do it, so why ostracize other people that want to get involved in it? <laughs> exactly. I mean, so I guess that's kind of my take. I, I don't know if that's the intent uh, of your question, but that's kind of how I see. Hey, it. it's know, the way you want to answer it. You're, I asked you the question, you answered your way. That's your answer. Uh, ready for the last one? Sure. Last question, number eight. Who do you think I should ask these questions to next and why? Um, I would say uh, uh, there's a YouTuber uh, and guy I'm friends with. Uh, his name is uh, Engineer Jeff. Okay. You've seen any of his stuff. Not yet. Um, if you give me a link after the show, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll look at his channel. Yeah, check out his channel and you can drop it in there. He uh, he uh, he probably he actually didn't put out that many videos when he first started, and he's a little bit like me where he kind of went in different directions with what he wanted to do. Um, but he's in the last few months he's really gotten focused, and uh, he's an excellent painter. Okay. Um, I, I really I like his painting style. Um, he. Uh, He's actually, he's something that I'm not. He's actually very entertaining. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I'm much more analytical and, you 
I'll give you hard facts and information. I'll let you pick my brain. But I understand. You're not, you're not going to walk away going, man, that was just so enjoyable. You know, it's, I'm a bit more maybe stoic or stale, I guess. But uh, <laughs> uh, he's an entertaining guy. He's, he's got some really good information. Um, he's got a keen sense for the art. You know, he's, he's got a good eye when it comes to the models. He's a good painter. All right. And uh, I just, I think uh, he's pretty opinionated on some of this stuff. I think he'd make a good interview. Okay. Um, and uh, he's, been, he's been around a while. And, uh, and yeah, I, I also I think, you know, it wouldn't hurt to give him a little bit of exposure as well. I'd like to see, uh, you know, more people uh, viewing some of the material that he's doing. And I think he might even possibly do a podcast in the future. Okay, um, that's cool. So he's got a lot of things on his plate, and uh, he's really been focusing lately. And I think I think he'd make a good interview for sure. Yeah. All right. Well, that's the eight questions, and now this is the time I call shameless plug time. This is the time you could. Plug. This is what you can. You know, if you have a website, you have a Facebook, you have a Google Plus, all that stuff. If you want to shout out somebody that you care about, it's your time to talk away. Yeah. Well, we probably lost. You know. 80% of the audience by now anyway. So, um, <laughs> Sometimes. Yeah. If they last to the end of my video, more power to you guys. They're, they're tough. They're, they're, uh, they're real troopers. So I, if you have stuck around this long, I do appreciate it. Um, I would say it's different for me. I'm, I'm not a commission painter. I'm, uh, I really don't have uh, much of a business angle when it comes to my YouTube channel. really the only endeavor that I have. Okay. Um, my, my business angle from that is really to try to just you know, take any uh, AdSense revenue that I get and, and invest it back in the channel for content, uh, for to invest in Kickstarters and other games and stuff like that, to you know put up whatever more more material, more content. So I would say, you know, as far as the shameless plug, you know, if, you, if you've watched this long, make sure you, if you're not subscribed to my channel, to you know go check it out. Um, also, to check out the other individuals that uh, uh, that I consider. Uh, my confidants. These are the people that uh, uh, they embraced me early on in the hobby, you know, two years ago, and uh, give give me a lot of good uh, good knowledge, uh, good advice. Um, that's uh, obviously an awesome paint job. If you don't know who he is, um, get to his channel, check him out. Um, uh, Chung over at uh, WGC Consortium. Um, they really uh, they are they are doing something now that I think. Uh, the YouTube community specifically and our community really needs uh, for a very long time. YouTube's been split up into different little camps, so to speak. Um, and in some respects, it can get kind of clicky. Even. Um, they're doing something now where they're really trying to put, uh, they're trying to put focus on community. And mm -hmm. they're trying to Kind of like Braveheart, right? They're standing up and they're saying, "Unite the clans!" You know, they're trying to get everybody into one place to say, "Hey, you know, you know, be part of this consortium. Either you're going to be a contributor, or you're going to be part of the legion, or you're just a fan. And we'll let you post videos and responses, and, and you know, check out our live shows. And they're trying to do everything, doing tactics and live game and tutorials. And they're really." trying to socially network and trying to kind of be the glue to, to stick this fragmented community, so to speak, um, hopefully in one place. And I'd love to see uh, people get involved in that to, uh, to spread the word. And I agree that. We finally get people, because you hear a lot of people use the word community. Um, and, and it's kind of a, it's an ambiguous term. Um, it's more of a theoretical community where certain camps, you know what I mean? And I'd, I'd really love there to be just one spot where everybody goes. So they've been partnering up lately with uh, Mini Wargaming, and you're just seeing a lot of uh, big, pretty big names in YouTube kind of come together, and everybody's gelling, and uh, they're trying. And it, it really is for a good... Um, it, it's for the, a good cause, I guess, so to speak. Uh, it's a lot of people look at it. Oh, well, they're just trying to make money. And, you know, well, you know that may be. You know, some of these people are commission painters, and they got to make a living too. But at the heart of everything, they're trying to pull everybody together and share information. Oh yeah. 
um, and, and really get this community thing rolling. And, you know, I, I, I implore you to, uh, to check that out and to, uh, you know, to take part in that. It, it's a resource that's available and, and check that out. Um, so yeah, I covered, uh, the consortium, we covered less, covered my channel and, uh, I've got other people I, on my channel that, uh, you should check out as well. You fan hammer minis. Um, there's another guy that's, uh, he's given a lot to this community. Um, I forget what he's got. He's got like three or 400 videos. Um, and he really has given a lot to this community and really gotten nothing back in return. Um, he, he, he doesn't get a lot of, you know, ad revenue. And <coughs> he's, uh, he's trying to, he's really trying to make, you know, uh, make himself a business of things. And, uh, he's got a big heart and mm -hmm. he's a great guy. And he, uh, he will be happy to answer any questions you have about, you know, sculpting and green stuff. I mean, he's a wealth of information. Unlike me, who, you know, when I was 16, got in the hobby and I just kind of didn't do it until the last couple of years. He has literally been in the hobby, you know, I don't know, 20 or 30 years. So he's got a vast amount of information. But anyway, um, definitely check him out. And, uh, and yeah, so. That's pretty much my shameless plug. Other than that, I don't really have a, I don't have a big agenda. You know, just check out my channel and, and the people that I'm, um, all right, that I'm associated with, and uh, let's let's all be in one place and try to be a big happy family. I agree with that. If that's possible, you know. And then when I play uh, play you in, in in some sort of a war game, may I kick your ass? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the show. Thank you for being right. on it. Like I, yeah. like I say to everybody, make sure the hobby's fun and keep your blade sharp. Have a nice day, guys. All right. Peace out.